Kate Baker and friends, huh? Let me know if you need a manager. <laughs> well, we've been doing a series called Future Family, trying to look at the things that our modern families are facing that maybe we haven't faced in previous generations. And we started out by talking about Joseph and his dysfunctional family and decided that if God could use that family, he could use any of ours, no matter how complicated they are. We then took a, a, a new look at Ephesians chapter 5 and discovered that while this is probably one of the most misunderstood passages in all of Scripture, that the writer is much more focused on us being servant leaders to one another in the family than trying to determine who has to be head of the household. We then talked about family conflict and discovered that uh, the use of iMessages is a great way to convey our needs and feelings to one another. And then we had Pastor Paul use his media background and talk about how to manage and handle social media so that uh, it adds to our families instead of taking away. Last Sunday, we took a look at blended families, talked about the fact that there's 16 million, million single-parent families in our nation, that 50% of all families in the United States are either remarried or recoupled. Today, we're going to take a look at that special contribution, that unique relationship between grandparent and grandchild, and try to look at how things in biblical times, what was the biblical family like in those times? Are we perhaps missing something today that used to be there? So again, thank you to grandparents and grandchildren who came today. We appreciate you helping us celebrate this special relationship because I think it's one that's often taken for granted. It almost seems trite to talk about this in some ways. I had a adopted grandparent from my first charge in Mason, New Ross, and uh, her name was Vivian Norman, and she used to have a lot of country wisdom, and she used to say this over and over, my grandchildren make me twice happy, happy when they come and happy when they go. <laughs> there's a lot of truth to that, isn't there? <laughs> but I'd suggest there's something deeper going on in a grandparent and child relationship that's been lost in our mobile society, where often we get moved too far away from our children and our grandchildren. You know, I was separated by many miles from my grandparents growing up. My dad's parents lived in Missouri, western Missouri, and my mom's family lived in eastern Colorado. And so we only saw them once a year. And so our practice was to take a two-week vacation, spend one week in Missouri, one week in Colorado. Well, let me tell you, even though that was such a short time, they represent some of the highlights of my life. My dad's family in Missouri, they, they had a full-service farm. So they had cattle, crops, baled hay, milk cows, chickens, even had a horse that we always got to uh, ride each year. And so there was lots of experiences to have. I'll never forget how cool it was to be milking a cow or going out and gathering the eggs uh, every morning from the chickens, or riding that horse or bailing the hays with it. He had one of those balers with the kick, quick kick balers, so they come flying through the air and you know, just knocking them twice in the wagon. And Grandpa always had a, a project for my dad to do when he arrived, some repairs or uh, new things to do. So we'd always go into town and we'd meet dad's friends growing up because they all recalled him from those many years ago. Now, Grandma Stone's home was not quite as thrilling. She was a very stern religious personality. She didn't like long hair. She was always trying to cut my sideburns, always threatened that at least. And she was always pleading for one of us to become a preacher in the family. And I wanted nothing to do with that. My grandfather, he had hardened the arteries, as we called it then. He spent his days walking, mumbling, but we got used to it. And I loved listening to my aunts and uncles who would talk about my grandfather because they remembered him as a very compassionate and sensitive man. Now, in spite of that uh, less fun time at Grandma Stone's, one of the things that would often happen, though, is my mother was from a big family. There were six of the siblings. And they were scattered all over the country after World War II. And often they would get their vacations to coincide. And so that week of vacation out there would be a family reunion 
and it was a blast. And we'd often hear the stories. We'd often uh, split time between Yuma and Eastern Colorado and my Uncle Ralph's home in Denver, and we'd go up into the Rocky Mountains each time we, we gathered. It was a great time. What's interesting to me was I can add up all those weeks, and that probably adds up about 30 to 35 weeks out of my entire life. But there are some of the best times of my life. And those weeks expanded my world. They gave me a feeling of family roots, which was really important to me with my dysfunctional family, and it helped me appreciate the traits that I inherited. So let's talk about what a typical Jewish family looked like. Now, in Jewish tradition, you, you've probably read your Bibles and you've read a lot about polygamy. We know that Abraham had Sarah and Hagar. We know that Jacob had Rachel and Leah, and then two slave wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. We've read about the many wives of King David. We know that he had at least eight that are named, and there's more beyond that. And then we know that King Solomon had a thousand wives and concubines. But that was the exception more than the rule, because women cost money. Most peasants had one wife. And the way that it worked was that whenever there was a marriage, there was one family that lost and one family they gained. And so you always would go and move into the home of the male's family, the groom's family, which meant there had to be a, a price paid to the bride's family. There was actually money exchanged and, and negotiated. And I guess you knew what you're worth depending on what you cost to make it afford. But it meant that you moved into that groom's family, and the tradition was that a new room would be built onto the house of the groom's father. As a matter of fact, there's a scripture. John 14 talks about that. When Jesus says, in my father's house are many rooms, it's referring to that, that bridegroom imagery of a home being added onto. Now, let's talk about what that home looked like. So typically there would be a one-room house. Every house is a little different depending on your wealth, just like today. And then when you add it on, as we just described, it would look a little like this. And so often you would not just put the room right side by side, but you would have some space, some open air between that first room and the second room, and it would become a courtyard. You'd often put a, a wall along the front and along the back, and you put a, a door in. Because life in these homes were not all that exciting. It was dark. You might have some windows up high. They'd have shutters. You sometimes cooked inside, so it was smoky. So life was spent often outside. Matter of fact, they had roofs that would be made with some planks, and then they'd put fern, ferns on top and, and then put clay on that, a little layer of lime to try to keep it somewhat uh, waterproof. And you'd often spend part of your day up there. It was used for napping might be used for other activities at night. If it was a, a hot night, you would sleep up there. So you get a picture now of how much people were surrounded by many family members. So typically, grandparents are nearby, aunts and uncles. A child was not raised just by their mother and their father, but by a whole clan of people. In fact, Michael Cruz describes this pretty well. In his quote, in a way, family can be used as, viewed as concentric circles with a household at the center. And the household would be just like our nuclear family. Then the clan would be farther out. And then beyond that would be the tribe. They even had these Jewish terms with the bayat, the mishpaka, and the mata, the household, the clan, and the tribe. So all this leads to the question of who is in your clan, who is in that extended family or friends that help surround you and your children as they did in biblical times. And the reality is, this is really the way most of the world is still to today. The United States is kind of the exception in all this. In Western society, we're so mobile, so independent, and so isolated that I wonder if our children are missing some of that connectedness, that rootedness. And certainly it's helpful to have more influences around a child today. I envy those of you who come to church and on a regular basis, you're surrounded 
by your children and grandchildren. Many of you have moved to Noblesville just for the very fact to be near your children and your grandchildren. The other day, we opened the preschool, and I was opening doors, letting families in, and I know some of the children were being brought in by their grandparents who were stepping in, stepping up as the parents that have to work during that time. Do you know the importance of a plan? God did design us to have all of our needs met just by that nuclear family. We often hear that phrase, it takes a village. I'd suggest to you the more biblical phrase is it takes a plan to raise a child. But you know, not all of us are surrounded by family. Some of us don't have that luxury. Sometimes our jobs takes us to this place by ourselves. And so for me, that's where the church comes in. That's always been my concept of church is that extended family. That's why when we baptize a child, we carry them through the congregation to emphasize you have a responsibility. You are there to be their spiritual mentors, to support that family in any way possible. You know, my children have never lived near the, their grandparents, and they didn't find them all that helpful anyway, because both sets of our grandparents just had a lot of their own needs to worry about. They, they both lack that relational strength that they needed. And so they, they didn't come to our children's activities. They, they didn't call and inquire about them. It just wasn't in their makeup. And the interesting thing was that I noticed that wherever I went, every church that I've had, my children naturally would just find grandparents. It would just happen. It wasn't planned. It wasn't organized. It just, the relationship came together. And so they would be our surrogate grandparents, and they would have us over for dinner. They'd show up for the kids' activities at school. They would offer those hugs after church every Sunday. My kids never lacked for any of that emotional support. It was always there for them. So I leave with you that, that understanding that look around. There might be somebody who needs a grandparent or a grandchild or an aunt and or an uncle. There's somebody to help surround and support because I think that's the way God intended us to be. Let me close by thinking about the importance of that plan, the importance of grandparents as the conveyors of faith, not just to your children, but to your grandchildren as well. Rick and Clara are a couple that have always been doting grandparents been there for their two granddaughters. They cared for them sometimes. They were involved in their lives at every opportunity. And they knew their role was an important one. But they found a new responsibility when they took a grandparenting study. And something changed. Rick described it this way. He said, of course, I was already a grandfather. In fact, I would describe myself as a Christian grandfather. But it never occurred to me to be an intentional Christian grandfather. And the change came for him when he heard for the first time in a new way that second passage that Pastor Aaron read that finishes at Deuteronomy 4.9 by saying that we are to teach these laws to our children and our grandchildren. That one word changed everything for him. So now Rick looks for appropriate opportunities to share Christ in his grandchildren's lives. He's, he's ramped up the times that he prays for them. When he gets opportunities, he reads biblical stories to them. And he understands that his role now is of such spiritual significance. He just needed a new vision for that relationship. And so he sees himself now, not just as a doty grandparent, not just as a secondary caregiver, but as a spiritual influencer. I think Psalm 71 drives this home just as well. Notice he says, I will help others remember nothing but your righteous deeds. Not until I tell generations about your mighty arm, all who are yet to come about your strength. And of course, it has to even mention, even in my old age with gray hair, they had to say the gray hair, didn't they? <clears throat> Unfortunately, I've been separated from my children by too many miles. I got a chance yesterday to spend time with a couple of them. And so what's frustrating to me is not be there for their everyday lives. 
But one thing I've done pretty well, though, up to this point, at least they would say this, I think in their eyes they see it, is I've been a pretty good keeper of family traditions. Whether it's making sure we, we go to Hoosier Hysteria every year, or take a trip to the State Fair, or hold that family vacation so we all get together for some meaningful time. But you know, there's also other traditions. And that's that conveying of faith. The same thing can happen with our faith if we find those opportunities. One of the things that I've been doing that I did with my children was that whenever they were baptized, <clears throat> I wrote them a letter about what that baptism meant to me, about the significance of it, because sometimes people complain that when they grow up, they weren't there to make that decision to be baptized, and so they, it doesn't mean as much to them. So that letter is written to help them make that more important to them. Well, I've started the practice with my grandchildren. I've had the privilege of baptizing all three of my grandchildren. And just two weeks ago, I baptized Nella down in Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah. I don't know where she gets the looks. It's not for me. But this is the letter I wrote for Nella for her mother to keep with her records and perhaps someday pull it out. It says, Dear Nella, I write this letter because in many years of ministry, sometimes individuals have come to me wondering if they should be baptized as adults because they don't remember their infant baptism. In the United Methodist Church, we have this beautiful concept which comes from our founder, John Wesley, called prevenient grace. It declares that even before we can decide to accept Jesus into our lives, God has been preparing the way. God clears this path through other significant people and through meaningful events and our lives. Your baptism on August 11, 2019 was a statement that God has come to you long before you will ever begin to think about the divine presence in your life. Nella, this will be important at some point, maybe many times in your life. There may be periods when you will not feel worthy to be loved by God or anyone else for that matter. Our world is good at tearing people down. Your baptism serves as a reminder that God is never far away. Your baptism declares you are God's special child and always God's child, no matter what you've done or what has been done to you. If you're reading this letter at some low point in your life, hear that message. Feel the unconditional love and live into the life God is calling you to. Remember your baptism, Nella, and be thankful. Sincerely. Papa. Well, I know pastors get unique opportunities to do things like this, but you know, you get unique opportunities as well. Maybe you need to write a letter. Maybe there's some other way that you can intentionally share your faith when it's appropriate without violating the values of your children. And if you're trying to raise a family right now, I hope that you are identifying who is in your clan and celebrate that. Make time for it. Hopefully, you can name who is in your clan. Let's pray. Lord, we celebrate today all those that surround our families. It truly does take a clan to raise a child. So help us be intentional. Help us to be willing. Help us to be there. Help us to look for those intentional opportunities to share our faith so that this next generation will still have faith. This is our hope and prayer through Christ, who is our Lord. Amen.